Welcome all junior employees, assistant to the detectives, and assistant detectives to the overviews of the Anti-Strangling Task Force. This is the overview for the Extraterrestrial Time Traveling Task Force. Time travel has an incredibly important role in the Scranton Strangler mystery. I want to bring to your attention two particular scenes to start with. The first is the prank in branch closing when Jim sends Dwight faxes from himself from the future. And the main thing I want to get across here guys is Dwight takes the faxes seriously. We can obviously interpret this from a humorous perspective, but the veneer is simply humor. Dwight takes this stuff seriously because to Dwight, time travel is a very real phenomena. The second scene is from the episode 816 After Hours, when Dwight is trying to get jiggy with a Nelly. He tells us about his ancestors. But my ancestors never worked in corporate America. They were farmers. And before that, hunters. And before that, time travelers. And before that, me again. So he tells us at some point his ancestors were time travelers and then Dwight again. Now this is actually establishing a time loop and we're going to touch on the time loop in a moment. Now there are two movies which form the primary inspiration for involving time travel into the Scranton Strangler mystery. And these movies are Back to the Future and The Terminator. In fact, they are referenced so often that they actually form their own motif. Now guys, if you like this girl from the club and you haven't seen Back to the Future or The Terminator, this is an immediate homework assignment for you. You gotta see these two movies, especially if your focus is going to be on the time traveling element of this mystery. Now there are a number of parallels between these two movies and the Scranton Strangler mystery. If you've seen the Great Scott Film Forensics Overview, you'll know that movies provide us with important building blocks of this Scranton Strangler story, and specifically central concepts or foundational concepts are ported into the show. So the first parallel I want to mention is from Back to the Future, and specifically the mine shafts parallel. In Back to the Future 3, the dock that's transported to 1885 hides the DeLorean in an abandoned mine shaft. Now, mine shafts are referenced a number of times throughout the series. We have the example where Michael wants to take uh, the staff down an abandoned mine shaft as an excursion. Um, trying to give the troops here a little bit of a boost, and I was thinking then maybe we could bring them down to uh, go on your big ride. You mean the elevator that takes you down in the mine shaft? And we've also got this older guy from the seminar episode uh, who says he wants to invest in a number of abandoned mine shafts. I was thinking we could buy up a bunch of abandoned mine shafts. Oh, oh that's great. There's a big... I don't know. Big future in that. So they do form their own motif. And interestingly, Dwight says that there's a big future in that. And the current interpretation around that is Dwight actually sourced his time traveling capabilities from an abandoned mine shaft as well. We're going to touch on that a little bit later in this episode, but that's the first parallel I want to mention. The last parallel I want to mention for now regarding Back to the Future is the vid glasses. In Back to the Future 2, the doc is seen coming back from the the future with a set of vid glasses. We also see Marty's future children wearing a set of vid glasses and this is one of the concepts that is strongly ported across uh, to Dwight and his time traveling capabilities and we're going to touch on that again a little bit later in this episode. To jump to the Terminator, the first parallel I want to mention is the concept of a time traveling robot. Now, obviously, that's a central theme in all the Terminator movies is that we have like an assassin robot that's sent into the past by Skynet. And, and that's what that's what a Terminator is. Obviously, for those of you who've seen the movie, that's obvious. Now, the concept of a robot is also a repeated motif in the show and specifically very strongly linked to Dwight himself. In the Banker episode, it's Dwight who is Computron. Hi. Hello, Eric Ward. Welcome to Dunder Mifflin. I am Computron. 
your answer to everything. When Ed Truck dies and, and Michael's talking with Dwight about creating a statue for him, Dwight suggests making a robot with a limited power cord length so the robot doesn't go rogue. That is not a statue, that is a robot. I think that is a great way to honor Ed. And how big do you want this robot? Life size. Mm, no, better make it two thirds. Easier to stop if it turns on us. I gave him a six foot extension cord so he can't chase us. Dwight takes on the computer and he talks about how sometimes robots can become sentient or machines can come alive. It appears Dunder Mifflin has purchased a sentient computer. It appears that the website has become alive. This happens to computers and robots sometimes. In Threat Level Midnight, Dwight wants to play the part of a robot and Michael does actually make him a robot by the end of the movie. Breakfast for me, it's a breakfast for you. So we have a very strong motif around robots. And I guess the question you may be asking now is, well, is Dwight himself actually a robot? Now, the answer to this is yes and no. And this comes back to the curse of three. Curse of three. We've mentioned a number of examples uh, on this particular channel about the curse of three. We have the intro sequence, the curse of three secret sign. We have the three month motif video. So curse of three repeated there again. You can put all the love triangles in the curse of three list. If you've seen Dexter Scranton Strangler connection, you'll know that the creators actually used a real image of a real triple homicide. So as questionable as that may be, the reason that particular homicide was chosen because it again links into the creator's concept of the curse of three. And as we continue this investigation, all those Curse of Three examples are going to be brought to the forefront. But in this case, the Curse of Three relates to three Dwight Schrute lookalikes. Now, this is the current hypothesis based on my current investigations over the last few years. There are three Dwight Schrutes. We've got what we're going to call the OG Dwight Schrute. Then we have a Dwight Schrute replicant or clone. And that's revealed to us in the Survivor Man episode. When we, when we break down that episode, we're going to talk about, uh, which is a huge discovery in that episode, we really have a strong implication around Dwight's double there. But the third Dwight Schrute is also a robot version of himself. And it's assumed at this stage that that robot version of himself has gone rogue. Uh, OG Dwight Schrute has lost control over the robot version of himself. So that's the curse of three. The three Dwight Schrute lookalikes. We've got OG Dwight. Dwight's clone and the robot version of Dwight. Now, it's also important to very briefly mention here that Dwight does have a twin brother, an identical twin brother. And we haven't gone into this just yet, but his twin brother is not a part of that curse of three uh, hypothesis at this stage, because ultimately his twin brother is not Dwight Schrute. So he doesn't form one of these three, but it's something important to mention now. So ultimately, this hypothesis is put together by the motif of the Terminator, the motif around robots, and also other findings that have happened throughout other episodes. The other parallel from the Terminator that I want to address here is the concept of the infinite time loop. Now, before I continue, guys, the Terminator movie's time loop or timeline is a subject of, you know, significant speculation and discussion and disagreement. And uh, we're not going to go into detail around the Terminator time loop. In, in fact, we're going to sort of do the opposite. I'm going to really boil it down to its most basic parts, and we're going to condense it. Now, the Terminator time loop can be summarized like this. John Connor, sends Carl Reese into the past to protect his mother. He impregnates Sarah Connor and then John Connor is born. And then the series of events will continue to repeat 
in this infinite time loop cycle. Now, obviously this is condensed and simplified and we need to apply this to the time loop that Dwight gives us in the episode After Hours. His time loop is also infinite and we need to treat it as such. So correlating the similarities to the Terminator time loop, in some senses, Dwight's time loop is actually an escalation. In the case of the Terminator, John Connor sends back Carl Reese to set up the events that would lead to his conception. Whereas in the case of Dwight Schrute's time loop, Dwight Schrute is ultimately his own ancestor. So acknowledging this, in some senses, it's not so much that Dwight Schrute is a Schrute, but rather his ancestors are Dwight Schrute. Now, it's not quite as straightforward as you'd think, guys. And I have to mention this now because it impacts the time loop. They did not actually give birth to Dwight. And you may be like, well, what, what do you mean by that? As we continue in this investigation, you're going to realize that Dwight, in fact, was abducted as a baby. Not only him, Kevin as well as Creed. What's really happening at Schrute Farms is something a lot more dark and disturbing, right? So the Schrute family abducts Dwight from his real biological parents. Then that Dwight goes into the past and gives birth to the Schrute bloodline that will ultimately abduct him in the future. So in one sense, he is a Schrute, but he's not a Schrute. The Schrutes don't give birth to Dwight. Dwight gives birth to the Schrutes. Okay, do you have the Sharpie? Keep simulating. Do you have the Sharpie? Yes, I do. Okay, when the baby emerges, mark it secretly in a kind of a mark that only you could recognize and no baby snatcher could ever copy. Okay. So in that sense, it's both paradoxical and also applies the inversion principle. I've mentioned the inversion principle uh, in another episode on the channel. That dedicated video will be coming soon, but you can see how everything's been inverted here. So given that Dwight was abducted, we can actually at a step here in the time loop and part of our challenge is to actually fill in the gaps of this time loop understanding the events that occurred between each stage so there's one stage here where before we go from Farmers to Dwight, we have an abduction. Similarly, there are a number of other stages that sort of, you know, raise questions. We, if we go to the beginning of the time loop, it's Dwight, then time travelers, then hunters. So it appears as though in this stage, there was some sort of a cataclysmic doomsday event where his ancestors lost time traveling capabilities. We can also include the conception here. So at some point, Dwight obviously has to procreate uh, with one of his ancestors in order for this time loop to start. So that's an event that has to be detailed. And another one is Dwight's resurrection. If you've seen great Scott film forensics, you'll know that through motif and also dialogue, we're able to come to the conclusion that at some point, Dwight Dwight came out of the grave. Now, understanding that there are actually three Dwight Schrute lookalikes, which Dwight Schrute that actually was is the first area of interest. But at some point in this time loop, Dwight's resurrection had to have occurred as well. So these are the elements that have already been mentioned and investigated on the channel so far. So how does Dwight Schrute time travel? The way he does it is with his Terminator styled vid glasses. That is the parallel from Back to the Future. When Dwight wears his glasses, Dwight is in time traveling mode. The glasses can be compared uh, to the Doc's DeLorean in the Back to the Future series. Now there's a couple of scenes that very strongly suggest this. The first one I want to mention is the episode Dwight's speech in the deleted scenes. In the deleted scenes, Dwight enters the office with the glasses on. He sits down and says to Jim, my future is so bright. My future is so bright, Jim. It's so bright that... What? Do you know? Is there something I gotta wear? Huh? Is there something I gotta wear? 
Huh? Now, as you just saw, guys, he also asks Jim, is there something I got to wear? And then he taps on the glasses. That message is actually to us, the viewer. It's telling us what he has to wear in order to time travel are those glasses. Whenever you see Dwight wearing those glasses, he is somehow affecting the timeline, either looking into the future or that Dwight himself is from a different time space continuum. To reinforce this, so this concept does become a motif in the episode Office Olympics when Dwight is on the way with Michael to the condo that he is buying, Dwight puts on his glasses, points to himself and says, check it out, Terminator. Check it out, I'm Terminator. So you can see guys, there is a very strong link to time travel. It links into the motif, into the parallels of the movies. And this is as close to being explicitly told that Dwight's glasses are his primary time traveling device. Now regarding their origin, we have that old guy who's talking about purchasing a number of abandoned mine shafts. Dwight says there's a big future in that. I was thinking we could buy up a bunch of abandoned mine shafts. Oh, that's great. There's a big, a big a future in that. So conceptually, via the movie interpretation and the narrative, the current hypothesis is that Dwight retrieved those vid glasses from an abandoned mine shaft the same way uh, that Doc did in 1955. To continue on to the parallel, the current hypothesis is that Dwight himself, the past version of himself, left those vid glasses in the mine shaft so that future Dwight can retrieve them at a later date. Now, the complete scope of the powers is something that has to be further investigated, but this is how Dwight does it, and this is where they came from. Now, in his time loop, he also tells us that his family or ancestors had time traveling capabilities. If you've been following this investigation closely, you'll know that I've said on a number of occasions that Creed is Dwight's adopted father and that Kevin is Dwight's adopted brother. I still haven't shared the analysis of those things. We will get to that at some point, but there is evidence to suggest that Kevin actually time travels in the show. In the episode 910 Lice, Kevin puts a whole bunch of bubble wrap into the baler. Now in this moment, it's almost as though Kevin disappears from the baler and just appears next to Nelly. And you can see Nelly actually reels back in shock in a sense of where did you come from? It's almost as though Kevin just appeared there. Now I know it's subtle, but there are a number of examples in this same style where people just sort of pop up out of nowhere. There's a number of examples where Dwight does it as well. And you also got to keep in mind that, you know, Dwight, Kevin, Creed, they know that the cameras are filming. So if they choose to harness their time traveling capabilities, it needs to be done in a very subtle and non-suspicious way. But this is one example where I firmly believe we see Kevin time traveling in this moment. Now I need to bring up the concept of the God bug here. Uh, in the episode Gossip, Kevin does imply that there's a little creature inside of him working him with controls. Now guys, to break down the puzzle of this episode, it relates back to the inversion principle. Michael tells us that out of all the rumors, only one was really true. But this is actually inverted and it's the opposite. It's only one rumor is false. The challenge and puzzle in this episode is to assess each rumor and understand how those rumors can be true and you ultimately get down to two rumors that have to be false. It's either Michael is a J. Crew model or Kevin has a tiny person inside of himself working him with controls. But this particular being is comparable to the God Bug from Starship Troopers. In Starship Troopers, the God Bug is able to take over people's bodies. It's able to speak through dead corpses and to possess people to a large degree. It can also absorb memories. And now the reason I'm mentioning this is it's important to at least be mindful of the fact whether Kevin is able to time travel or whether it's this being inside 
outside of Kevin. That's time traveling. And this is why the task force is called the Extraterrestrial Time Traveling Task Force. All elements relating to aliens and space and the moon, all which are very strong motifs, link into the directive of this task force. Which I guess somewhat brings us now to the why. I mean, why is Dwight time traveling? And the blueprint for this is provided to us in the episode Company Picnic, when Michael and Holly are discussing what their skit should be uh, for the Dunder Mifflin audience. We could do a movie sort of thing. We could do Back to the Future. Oh. We have to convince Dunder and Mifflin to go back in time and <laughs> fix their parents. So ultimately at this stage, the hypothesis is that Dwight is going back into the past to try and prevent the surrounding circumstances that will lead to his abduction, that will create the Scranton Strangler. That's not to say it's limited to this. There are a number of other complex elements which feed into this, but for now, that's the simplest way to boil down his particular objective. Now, the last thing I also want to mention, guys, is the concept of the Kobayashi uh, Maru. Now, I'm not a huge Star Trek fan, so if, if there are any Star Trek fans listening out there, you're welcome to correct me with whatever I get wrong. Right, but according to my research, the Kobayashi Maru was an unwinnable test uh, that they would give cadets in the Star Trek series, and it was really done to understand how new cadets will, you know, respond to next to impossible situations, what their thought process would be, so on and so forth. And in the episode Junior Salesman, Dwight gives Dwight Junior an unwinnable scenario, and obviously Dwight Junior says he'd Kobayashi Maru the whole thing. Now, the primary aspect for now that I want to discuss here is how this links into the time traveling concept because there's actually a lot more to discuss around this, right? But regarding the time traveling concept, I believe that Dwight is in some sort of a Kobayashi Maru situation where it doesn't matter how he changes the past, right? Somehow the, the changes in the future still end up feeding back into this infinite time loop. It's ultimately a time loop that Dwight cannot break. I don't believe at any point throughout the Scranton Strangler mystery that this time loop is ever broken. I believe it to be a Kobayashi Maru scenario. There is no way out. It will continue to cycle forever. If you've seen the episode Scranton Strangler episode titles, you'll know that the episode titles are mixed up. And one of the episode titles that we have in the show is Dunder Mifflin Infinity. So you, you can sort of think of that conceptually now how this time loop and the episode titles do actually link together. So guys, this is now nearing the end of the overview and the directive of this task force is as follows. The time loop needs to be monitored. Any changes in the time-space continuum also need to be monitored. Changes in the timeline can explain things like, you know, why Andy's parents change, why Pam's mum uh, changes, you know. It, it could explain a number of things, but in, in order to substantiate any particular hypothesis, we need to have a full understanding of what events have changed in the past. This team also needs to monitor all the clocks. There are a number of discrepancies throughout the show where there are different times displayed in different scenes. It's something that has to be seen from the time traveling perspective. Another task for this team is to also maintain the timeline of the show. So understanding, you know, how many weeks or days have passed between various episodes because it's not consistent, guys. It's not, you know, one week between each episode. Sometimes it's a matter of days, right? Sometimes within an episode, we scan through a number of days. Right, so understanding that is really important. Understanding the scope of Dwight's time traveling capabilities, something that has to be really focused in on, and perhaps through various motifs and narratives, that information will be given to us. The photocopiers need to be monitored, and lastly, the God bug needs to be followed. In some senses, this is a directive for all the task forces, but we need to understand what this God bug is doing. Is it able to possess other people? Is it just Kevin? We really need to understand the extraterrestrial element uh, of this mystery. So if Back to the Future is one of your favorite movies, if you love the Terminator series, then this is the task force for you. Welcome to the Anti-Strangling Task Force.